exiles from Babylon zigzag their way in and around the desert and finally arrived in Jerusalem. And before they left the land of their exile, their cheerleader, Dash Prophet, had encouraged them. I will make you a light to the nations, that my salvation might reach to the ends of the earth. Because the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, has chosen you. So not without misgivings and encouraged by the prophet and with great expectations, they left a comfortable Babylon. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, you were putting us on, weren't you, Isaiah? We left Babylon for this wasteland? You must be kidding. But in time, the promise unfolded, always within the parameters of human imperfection, always joined to human impatience, and often contrary to human expectations. But the people of Israel were joined together to praise and glorify the Holy One. And they would keep the alive the promise of the Messiah, and they would strengthen one another in living Torah. Truly, the Lord's promise shall be known to his servants. So do we Christians understand and value God's people, Israel, preparing the way for the Messiah. The Lord appointed 72 others whom he sent ahead of him. The mission, the beginning of a renewed Israel in Jesus, the realization of Israel's hope for salvation, but it's no longer the emphasis on the land or the temple, no. The reign of God is here at hand, and it means, first of all, forgiveness of sins. Now they were the temples of the living God meaning given to all the moments of life. True religion stresses interiority, not external observance. Good news indeed. In succeeding years, these wandering lay preachers with resurrection faith, these wandering lay preachers would go south to Egypt, north to Lebanon and Syria, east to Persia, which we now know as Iraq and Iran, and by the fourth century, they would take the trade route to China. So, the word that is Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, spread. And we hear Peter's exultant cry, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, so that you may announce the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were no people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So the self-understanding of the community of faith at the end of the first century, confident, mission-oriented, with the power of the Spirit and evangelizing people. And now, in all honesty, People on the outside and many people on the inside as well take a long look at the church and they say, you proclaim that you are the inbreaking of the reign of God. You must be kidding. We expect much more from you if this is who you truly are. For so many, rightly or wrongly, but for so many, the church has lost its credibility as a witness to the ever faithful Christ. So let's reflect on this for a few minutes. We can't deny the diminishing number of observant Catholics, many of them from our own family, certainly from my family, among our friends, a slogan, once a Catholic. And these people are not so much against the church, they're just indifferent. It doesn't enter into their consciousness. Diminishing numbers of priests, religious, empty convents. When I was ordained in 1951, there were 39 of us being ordained. This year, six. And we are told by authority, oh, the number is increasing. Yes, and the moon comes up at noon. 
And there are school closings, grammar schools, high schools, all over the nation, but not only in our nation, but all over the world. And there are other connected issues, you know, the scandals of priests and bishops, the continued centralization of decision-making in the church. So contrary to the decrees of Vatican II, and in our society, materialism, hedonism, and skepticism. And with all this turmoil, we Catholics have been humble. No longer, as when I was ordained, no longer the triumphant know-it-all people. We have come to know ourselves as a pilgrim people, searching, sometimes sinful people. And the temptation for all believers is to get off the train or to lose confidence in the power of the Spirit that is within us. But you know, there are signs that we are truly listening to the Holy Spirit. We have come to know, first of all, that beyond any human authority in the church, it is only the power of God's Holy Spirit that is the source of its life and vitality and unity and peace. No human authority does that. And as never before, in the long years of my life, as never before, the church is, connect is connecting the missions to the needs of the world. You may never have heard of the Catholic Relief Service. It's the agency of a worldwide mission of Catholic people, you, with your money, it's a mission to the wherever there is a need. And lay people are the ones who by and large are the administrators of this magnificent work of charity. When I helped out at Holy Family Church, I mentioned this one time in a homily, and a lady came up to me afterwards and she said, I am so glad that you mentioned that about Catholic Relief Services. My son is in Uganda, and he's the administrator of a rather large section for Catholic Relief Service. And he married a native woman. Ah, would this have happened 60 years ago? She would never have told anybody about it. <clears throat> the world is changing. And we are part of that world. Catholic Charities in Chicago. You know, all the other social services together do not affect what Catholic Charities in Chicago does. It dwarfs all other social agencies. And then there are the many lay people who join religious orders in ministering in foreign countries. The Jesuit volunteers, the Mary Noble Associates, doctors committed. I read in the paper just the other day about a husband and wife team of doctors. And they spent four years in South America, and now they're going to Asia. And they're bringing their children with them. Ah, the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, each of this are relatively small, but collectively, a growing, faith-conscious number of women and men in mission. And think of the way we understand marriage today. Husbands and wives, growing numbers conscious of the holiness of their lives, their mission to each other and to their children and to the wider community. So do you glorify God in this way. And then there are associations of priests and religious and lay people in Germany and Ireland and England and the United States challenging the status quo and challenging our leadership. Their voice is being heard. Maybe not accepted, but their voice is being heard. For example, they say, the Eucharist, we are told, is the source and summit of the Christian life. But how can we continue the present system of admitting to priesthood only celibate males when so many are without the celebration of Eucharist? And so here again we have ideals without structures to affect them. And the voice of people is being heard. It hasn't touched this diocese yet. But even now in the United States, especially in the western part of our country, there are Catholic parishes that only see a priest a couple of times a month. Something has to change because of the very ideals that we propose. Lay women and men, educated, now prepared to lead as directors of religious education for youngsters and adults, directors of liturgy, religious sisters, 
so highly educated in our day. You know, very honestly, most people don't realize that the sisters of the last many decades have received university and college educations far better than my education. And so we have these religious sisters now, many of them leading faith communities where there is no priest. And in our own parish, many involved, so many on the local level as never before, Volunteer ministers of care, ministers in liturgy, the food pantry. These are all sources of hope if you reflect upon them. I could go on and on, but I see Eagle down there looking at his watch, and so I won't. <laughs> so as we have come to a deeper love and study of sacred scripture, led by our Protestant friends, so they in turn, have learned from us. They have learned Catholic social thought. That trusting and believing in Jesus has to go something just beyond Jesus and me. I forget the man's name, I should know it, but he was the uh, chief uh, speechwriter for uh, President Bush. And it was he who somehow pushed that $75 million aid to Africa so many years ago for AIDS. And he said this, he said, I am not a Roman Catholic, but my conscience has been formed by Catholic social teaching. So things are happening in our world, things, beautiful things, that evidence in many ways the power of the Spirit. As never before in the history of the church, as never before, Christian people are connecting mission to life, to issues of war and peace of poverty in the midst of affluence, of addressing issues of immigration with a sense of compassion and charity. No easy answers to complex problems, but our point of reference today is Jesus. His life, his values, who came to bring peace and compassion and unity to all he encountered. So here we are, the children of those 72 disciples, and like them, sent to proclaim the immediacy of the reign of God as we address all of life's issues. May the Holy Spirit strengthen and enlighten us so that in ways that we can, we will reflect and echo God's reign, bringing light and life to others.